I want to thank, if you've paid attention over the many months, we have first of all commissioned uh, Gary to lead the Stephen ministry as he brought it back to life. Gary, would you stand? As well, we have commissioned as his leadership team, Wendy and Susie, if you could stand. Dewan, if you're here on this leadership team, we have been blessed. So the nine have multiplied because of the four, the one and the three. Thank you for multiplying love to the three of you as the leaders. Today is Reformation Sunday, 2023. It is the day we in the Protestant church tradition remember the actions of a German monk, Martin Luther, who on October 31st, 1517, nailed his 95 theses or grievances on the door of All Saints Church in Wittenberg, Germany. Now we know all these centuries later as Congregationalists, that wouldn't have happened here. <coughs> the trustees would have caught him by the front door and not allowed him to put a nail in the door, uh, but they probably would have given him duct tape to put it up, so at least it could be posted. It marks the beginning of the movement of Reformed Catholics who are now simply known as Protestants. Almost 506 years have passed since that day, and today I would like to lift up one of Luther's central points of the Reformation, a very central point of his teaching, the priesthood of all believers. This comes from 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. We begin today on a mountaintop overlooking promise. In Deuteronomy 34, we see Moses for the very last time. He has delivered his people Israel to the edge of the land of promise a land he will never enter. Although he dies before entering the land, Moses has guided them through 40 years in the desert and generations of maturation as a people of faith. And when he led their liberation from slavery in Egypt, they numbered 600,000. Now, on the edge of promise, there are two million about to cross the Jordan River into the promised land. And then we find out he's not going with them. God takes Moses to Mount Nebo, takes him to the peak. And from there, Moses can see all the future territory of the Promised Land. To the north, there is the Gilead Range. Dan can be seen 100 miles away to the northwest. 65 miles to the west, the Mediterranean Sea can be seen from the peak of Nemo to the south and southeast in the Negev Desert, and on the plain of Jordan, 50 miles away, everything can be seen. It is as if Moses can see forever. There is a tenderness in this final scene of Moses' life. Mercy and serenity meet on the mountaintop. The gentler manner, the gentle manner in which God deals with the faithful and diligent service servant is paradigmatic of God's great mercy, not only toward Moses, but towards God's chosen people, Israel. And the serenity with which Moses accepts his own mortality reveals the peace that has come to pervade his heart. He is ready to let go. He is ready to die. He is ready to be with God. Having seen it all, Moses dies there. He is buried in the valley of Moab in a place no one knows so that no shrine will ever be constructed in his memory. No tablet stands there. Nothing stands to remember where it was he was born. Through all his soaring triumphs and his bitter disappointments, 
through his public acclaim and his private sadnesses, Moses dies physically healthy and honored by all his people. The liberator, the lawgiver, the first reformer of our faith is gone. Of Moses, poet laureate, or Nobel Peace Laureate, excuse me, Eli Wiesel has written, Moses is the most solitary and most powerful hero of biblical history. The immensity of his task and the scope of his experience command our admiration, our reverence, our awe. His passion for social justice, his struggle for national liberation, his triumphs and his disappointments, his poetic inspiration, his gifts as a strategist and organizational genius, his complex relationship with God and God's people, his condemnations and blessings, his bursts of anger, his silences, his efforts to reconcile the law with compassion, authority, and integrity. No individual ever, anywhere, accomplished so much for so many people in so many different domains. Moshe Rabbanu, our master and rabbi Moses, incomparable and unequaled. Thanks be to God for Moshe Rabbanu, our first and great reformer. But Moses is not the only reformer on Reformation Day. He is joined by Joshua Rabbanu, Jesus the rabbi. Jesus is the new Moses. If you read Paul as he writes about him, as you read other reformers who speak of him later, he's the new Moses. We find him once again entangled in conflict with the religious elite, this time the Pharisees, because he's already silenced the Sadducees. So the Pharisees come to oppose Jesus, believing he is not God's special agent on earth. They challenge him at every possible turn. And when they try to pin him down with tough questions, Jesus doesn't take off his mic and stomp off stage. Instead of leaving in a huff, he stands his ground and quotes Moses from Deuteronomy 6.5 and offers the great commandment, the great Shema, declared in every synagogue, in every service of worship forever. Amen. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. Then he adds the second great commandment from Leviticus. You shall also love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God is always first. Intertwined with your love of yourself and your neighbor, a close second. Then he says, on these two commandments, everything else stands. The law, the prophets, everything comes down to these two commandments. So let's be clear. The first commandment is to love God. Nothing else matters without that as our mandate in life. We have to yield to a divine authority before we can even look in the mirror in the morning. Nothing else matters without that mandate. Love God with everything that's in you. And then the second commandment is right behind it, to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And as we know, if you can't love yourself and be in healthy, productive relationships, you can't love your neighbor. Essentially, Jesus boils down 613 laws. <clears throat> 613 laws in Leviticus and Deuteronomy come down to two. In doing this, he offers a vision for a better world. But this reformer of the Levitical and Deuteronomic law is not alone. He has questions for the questioners. What do you think of the Messiah, he wants to know, after they've questioned him? Whose son is he? They answer him quite easily, he's David's son. We all know that. Jesus turns this around and points out that David calls him Lord. And so if David calls him Lord, how can he be David's son? That's it. They don't have a comeback. He shames them into silence. Now, I don't recommend using shame, but it works sometimes. <laughs> so he stumps the stumpers. 
So they take off their mics, and now they throw them down and stomp off, and they don't come back. There are no more antagonizing questions in the Gospel of Matthew. That's it. They're done. Did someone say, is there a Messiah in the house? Talk about drop the mic moments. But of course, our Messiah is not like that, not like the preacher in the pulpit. He's humble, so he's not dropping, dropping any mic. Throughout his ministry, Jesus answers all his critics, nose to nose, face to face. He never backs down. He never turns away in anger. He never runs and hides. He doesn't apologize for who he is and what he believes and about his relationship with God and others. Jesus is constantly at work, the work of reformation, reforming the laws and understanding the laws of Moses. I've always loved that the most quoted passages of Scripture in the Christian Scriptures outside of the Psalms are passages from Deuteronomy. Now, Deuteronomy, as you know, contains the reforming law code that has happened in Leviticus. So it takes Leviticus and reforms it, right? So Jesus is about reforming the reformed laws. Without a doubt, he is the first reformer of our Christian faith, and all the others follow him. A reformer is a person who makes changes to a system or a law in order to improve it. A reformer looks at what is in place and points out where the flaws are, or the inherent biases and prejudices, and goes about changing them. In our faith tradition, reformers are asking questions like this. What is God doing? Where is God working? What are the signs of the times? And what are they saying to the church? And how does the church respond to the signs of the times? All of us should play our part in reforming systems and institutions of which we're a part. If we sense that something isn't right, we need to do more than whine about it. Wine is meant for cheese, not for church. We need to change it, right? We have a saying in the United Church of Christ, we are reformed and reforming. We come from a reformed tradition. We are constantly in the work of reforming church and society. On this day, we lift up the reformers of our faith, Moses and Jesus. But let's not forget the reformer of our faith who comes along centuries later, Father Martin Luther. In 1520, just three years after his October Declaration of Independence, Martin Luther wrote one of his most important treaties. It is called The Freedom of a Christian. The Freedom of a Christian. This week I was reading it again. It is a magnificent piece. And I want to tell you, in all of the Protestant reformers through time, Martin Luther knew his Bible better than any. He quotes scripture appropriately and perfectly all the time. He's an amazing biblical theologian. He writes this piece, The Freedom of the Christian, and in it he puts special emphasis on something that is important to us. It's called the priesthood of all believers. In this beautiful and biblical treatise, he lays out his understanding of following Jesus and tells what the priesthood of all believers is about. I know for a fact, I'm just going to go way out on a limb, I know for a fact that Martin Luther would have loved the Stephen ministry. I'm just saying that right now, right here. You heard it here. Not only was it started by a Lutheran pastor, the Reverend Dr. Kenneth Howe, in 1975, but its essence is caring for others based on love. Okay? Stephen ministry is the embodiment of the priesthood of all believers. It is a Reformation ministry. Thank you, Ken and Martin. Luther writes that it is each of our callings to be a servant of God, pointing out that Holy Scripture makes no distinction between lay people and who he calls the ecclesiastics. That would be the clergy. That's you and me. <laughs> so we are the ecclesiastics. Although it is given many names, ministers, servants, stewards by those who lead, they cannot be wholly set apart because they are one together. It's the church, it's the body of Christ together. He continues, although we are all equally priests, we cannot all publicly minister and teach. In another place he writes, the priesthood of all believers does not mean that all believers need to be priests. It's just an office 
in the church, literally, figuratively sometimes, but it's a place where you serve. Each of you is the ministry that matters. You're the ministry that matters, he said. So the mistake that priests and ministers make is to lord that over others. Well, look who's talking 10 feet above the crowd, right? The key is that we are all called to be servants of God and servants of one another. All of us are called to be faithful to Christ. And as such, we are called to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves, says Luther. That's the true sign of a Christian, he writes. A Christian life is truly one where faith is active through love, he continues. This life finds expression in works of the freest service, cheerfully and lovingly done, in which a person willingly serves another without hope of reward and is satisfied the fullness that comes from serving others and the wealth of faith. I love that expression, the wealth of faith. Thank you, Martin. Near the end of the freedom of a Christian, he writes these words. We conclude, therefore, that a Christian lives not in himself. So I'm going to use the him and the he. Bear with me. It's old words. <laughs> so he says, we conclude, therefore, that a Christian lives not in himself, but in Christ and his neighbor. Otherwise, this person is not a Christian. He lives in Christ through faith. He lives in his neighbor through love. By faith, he is caught up beyond himself in God. By love, he moves out of himself into his neighbor. Yet he always remains in God and in God's love. I hope you heard the absolute exquisite beauty of Martin Luther in those words. Truly one of the most remarkable Christians ever to live and serve. Today, we commissioned nine new Stephen ministers, resurrecting a ministry which was once alive and vibrant. Christian scripture tells us that unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it cannot rise up. We witness the rising of that seed today. Thanks be to God and thanks be to Gary for helping us plant the seeds for this caring ministry and a birth on Reformation Sunday. Their ministry rising is a sign for all of us. We are all God's embodiment of the priesthood of all believers. Each of us is a servant of God. Each of us is a steward of the Lord. Each of us is called to follow Christ faithfully and joyfully, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Today, I invite each of us and each of you to find your place in the reformation of faith and life at First Church. We are all ministers here, all of us. May God bless us and find for us a creative ministry to step into. And if it's not there, create it now. <laughs>